Uh, hello and welcome to the panel discussion on reviewing the serials cataloguing landscape. Uh, my name is Natasha Avery Jones and I'm your host for this session. Um, I've spent my career based in cataloguing and serials, um, many of them in Suncat, uh, which was the Serials Union catalogue for research libraries in the UK. Uh, prior to that, I spent over 10 years at the Bodleian Libraries, including lots of retrospective conversion, database maintenance and serials. And I'm currently the systems librarian at the Advocates Library in Edinburgh. So a serials cataloguing discussion panel. Yeah, um, we all know that serials and their cataloguing are complicated, but not quite as complicated as many people think. This panel is a chance to discuss our trials and tribulations when working with serials, as well as the highs, you know, like the, uh, the satisfaction of getting a complicated title with lots of title changes and everything like that, all sorted out and looking lovely in your catalogue. Um, of your descriptive metadata, meaning that the researcher has found that one vital article in the journal that you catalogued, or of finding that someone else has catalogued the title you've been putting off for a while so that you can download their record. Uh, <laughs> I know that one from experience. Um, it's also an opportunity for us to discuss future workflows based on current and emerging standards. Um, we have a most experienced panel with us today um, covering a diverse range of serials cataloguing. We have Steve Shadel, who's the head of serials cataloguing at the University of Washington, Hans Jorg Leder, um, the head of department for the National Services at Berlin State University. He's the head of the ZDB, uh, which is the Union Catalogue of Serials for Germany and Austria. Uh, we have Bethan Ruddock again, the Senior Development Officer for the National Bibliographic Knowledge Base, which is obviously a JISC service. And Anastasia Keriyama, sorry about that, <laughs> the Librarian for Serials and E-Resources at the BFI Rubin Library in London. Um, there's a few housekeeping notes for, for, for the audience, um, obviously, but uh, please, um, huh, start again, sorry. We ask that all participants via the panel mute themselves for the session so that we can listen to the panel. If you have any questions, please ask them via the ch chat functionality present in Zoom. And please send them to me, Natasha, and I'll be keeping an eye on these and we'll suggest them to the panel when a previous question has been discussed. Um, we'll have a brief introduction from the panel and then we shall get to discussing serials cataloging. And I know from personal experience that once you get serials catalog uh, cataloger going on this on this subject, um, there's no stopping any of us. So I'm hoping that this is going to be a lively and interesting discussion. And on that note, I shall hand you over to the panel to introduce themselves, starting with Steve Shadel. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Steve Shadel. Um, I am the head of serials cataloging at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, if I could have the moderator uh, bring up my slides. I just have three very brief uh, slides. Um, and I am having some kind of bandwidth issues this morning. So I do hope that I manage to stay there for you. Um, so my career started at the U.S. ISSN Center at the Library of Congress for four years, and then I moved back to uh, Seattle, Washington to start my job at the University of Washington. My purpose here today is to talk to you about the CONSERV program, um, because I understand that you're dealing with um, some uh, administrative and organizational development issues. Um, within uh, the UK community. So that's going to be the focus of what I talk about. Today. I can answer anything, but that's going to be the focus of what I talk about over the next couple of minutes. My experience in that area, uh, I've been a workshop developer and trainer for the Serials Cataloging Cooperative Training Program uh, sponsored by CONSER. And I'm currently the project coordinator for the Directory of Open Access Journals project. Every year we take all of the new uh, DOAJ titles and make sure that we have full level cataloging available in the concert database for them. So I coordinate that project. 
Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Okay, so the concert program began as, uh, it started out, the acronym comes from Cooperative Online Serials. Um, when I worked at the Library of Congress in the early 1990s, uh, I would walk by, every day I would walk by these shelves, probably about 40 to 50 shelves worth of Princeton files that had printouts in them. And I later discovered that those were all of the Library of Congress backlog of serial catalog record maintenance. So back in the early 70s, um, the Library of Congress worked with uh, three of the major academic libraries in the United States to uh, begin having them help with maintenance uh, of their backlogs in the holdings that those libraries also had. So from that humble beginning of three libraries uh, was the start of the concert program. Um, currently the concert program has uh, 83 members, uh, 50 members that are associated specifically that do their own cataloging in the program and then 33 members that either work in specific areas such as topical funnel projects or language-based funnel projects, or they work within um, consortia. Um, so for example, what might be relevant for, for you is the fact that the consortia takes care of training their members and monitoring their members and managing the quality of their members. Um, and we currently have two concert uh, funnels established that are consortia funnels, um, one for the University of California and one for the Northwestern libraries in the US. So as of 2017, the concert file consists of over 1.2 million serial bibliographic records. Um, next slide, uh, final slide. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, for the last year that we have, uh, just to give you a size, a sense of the scope, uh, for uh, the database and the activities. Uh, the last year we have full uh, statistics for uh, concert, the concert program uh, participants authenticated uh, 15,000 new records and maintained uh, 26,000 records. Uh, as you know, serials are uh, ongoing publications and the bibliographic records uh, often require maintenance. So that's a large part of what concert libraries do. Um, the concert file, that 1.2 million records, are syndicated, are made available uh, from the Library of Congress at cost um, and uh, to anyone who wants to purchase them. Um, all of the key vendors and suppliers in the profession use the concert file as a base file for their products. So we consider it, uh, it's a very useful product and well used. Oops. Just lost my, there we go, thank you. Um, I did wanna mention that um, how to identify a concert record is if you look at these two mark fields, the 010 and the 042 fields, if both of those fields have something in them, then you're looking at a concert record. The reason I mention that now is because in files, I know that uh, the concert file was syndicated to Suncat um, so in order to identify whether what you're looking at in any particular source, whether it's in the Alma uh, Central um, in the community zone, uh, in the, the, follow, the uh, successor to Suncat, in any source, you can look at those two fields to see whether the record you have is actually uh, based on the concert record. The other two areas where concert has worked is um, developing standards and practice. And I wanted to provide these URLs for you. Um, this is the URL for the concert standard record. Um, one of the things that we have done as a community is to agree on standards and practices so that we are all doing the same or similar thing. We understand that there is judgment involved in serials cataloging, but as much as possible, we try to adhere to uh, the same practice. And then the other thing that concert has done, uh, developed over the years, Back in the uh, mid, uh, early to mid 2000s, the uh, concert uh, cooperative training program was developed. There are now five modules uh, covering serials cataloging and mark holdings. Um, only one of the modules, the basic serials cataloging has been updated to RDA, but all the materials are available online free of charge. And then we also developed extensive training materials, the concert cataloging manual. Um, I provided a link for that here. Um, uh, 
several, there's a small number of modules that have been not, not updated to RDA, but most of the cataloging manual is now current to RDA and reflects current concert cataloging practice. Um, so that's all I have for now. Thank you very much. And I pass it off to someone else. Sorry, just need to unmute myself again. And next we have uh, Hans, Hans Lieder. Are you happy to share your screen or would you like Jenny to do that, Hans? Well, can I be heard? Yes. Okay, well, I can so hear you. I hope everyone else can. <laughs> well, let's hope that I'm just pressing here on to give you my screen. Okay, that should do the trick, shouldn't it? Okay, I will, I will use my five minutes to just tell you where I sort of enter the game and what the situation in Germany is um, like. And I'll be talking about the National Union cat Catalog for Serials, <clears throat> which is a thing going in Germany and Austria. Um, what is it? It's a cooperation of about 3,700 partner institutions the largest uh, part of which, of course, are libraries, but we also have all the major archives and uh, research uh, organizations, all types of institutions you can really um, imagine that have newspaper, that have journals holdings. Um, we do all catalog into one uh, PICA, OCLC database. Um, and of course, we don't, like with everything else, there are some notable exceptions, which I shall not talk about uh, today. The, we have central editorial staff uh, being located in my library with just uh, below 30 people. So, um, <clears throat> you know, this is, of course, a major investment. The entire service is run by the State Library Berlin, which is my home institution and um, in cooperation with the German National Library. Some facts and figures. <clears throat> uh, now, first, our working definition of serials is basically uh, that comprises journals, newspapers, monographic series, databases, and websites. Mind you, having said that, I would um, um, bring your fo focus onto, on the journals. That is by far the, the, uh, the largest group of materials. In the ZDB, we have about um, 2 million title records um, contained. Uh, and about 17 million uh, records that describe various holdings uh, of these titles. Now, an interesting figure, you can see just under 50% online resources. That just shows us how, how fast this particular area has been growing in the last few years. Uh, we are a hugely linked um, catalog. We have about half a million links to authority records. Um, and that, of course, is due to the nature of journals, mainly corporate bodies. Um, some words about the ZDB, Zeitschriften, Datenbank, so at least you, you, you've heard it once from, from a native speaker, um, as an infrastructure. The uh, necessary, necessary prerequisite, of course, is standardization. And the one thing that we believe in is the ZDB ID for title records. And this ID, of course, is known to all participating um, systems. And, you know, all the OPECs and the union catalogs, they all carry this, uh, these ID um, numbers. So we are all able to exactly agree upon the nature of a specific title. Our daily business uh, is comprised in, in providing data to local uh, institutions by the regional library networks, but we also serve a variety of infrastructure functions in Germany and partly also in Austria. Um, <clears throat> we have an availability service with another uh, librarian partner. We, have, we are the infrastructure backbone of national digitization campaigns. Um, for example, um, can, newspaper digitization, uh, they're just running a national campaign and um, if any newspaper wishes to digitize a newspaper title, they will actually have to codify their intent in the ZDB so other libraries will know. Uh, we are also the infrastructure for national or regional preservation activities with a view on, on ongoing uh, resources. Um, we cooperate with a with the German digital library, which is a huge aggregator in the Europeana context. 
and to, they will set up a national newspaper portal and will provide the necessary metadata and some visualizations to them. And I'll show you some uh, a bit later. Um, and of course, we have a central catalog that aggregates the holdings of all major institutions in Germany and Austria. I'm almost at the end. Um, this is a little view on a title record. Uh, you don't have to read this stuff, but you can just by the color management, uh, color scheme, you can, I want to point out that all the pink bits are, are sort of um, are links to other resources, to, 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 uh, to an access point, what, whatever it is. You can see at the bottom that we have language, for example, that's a, that's a controlled vocabulary. Uh, we use or the country of publication that's also a controlled vocabulary and that links to the national authority file. Um, over here we have a quite interesting little picture. It has in the center the, the times and it shows the some of the relations that thing has, uh, namely um, parallel editions and successes and so forth. Uh, some of you will have a clear vision and see all those pink plus signs, you can expand that um, image uh, quite significantly. And I have done that for you through a number of clicks. And it would then look like this. Uh, you can will not be able to, to recognize anything, but you will appreciate the size of the, of, the, uh, of the connections. So you can go from here to anywhere, really. Um, my last slide, serials, it's sometimes very often a difficult material yes it is very slow to cooperate in that area yes it's very expensive but it is my creed that in the end it pays by us being able to to provide access and services and on that hopefully positive note i want to conclude thanks thank you very much hans that was great and uh let's move swiftly on to bethan um, and the MBK. So I shall hand over to you, Beth, and I'm sure you're happy sharing your slides. I am, yes. Thank you, Tasha. Uh, the right screen. There we are. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about um, the collaborative serials cataloging in the um, in the context of the MBK and the Library Hub. Um, So for those of you who were um, who were in the session um, earlier about the MBK, don't worry, I'm not going to tell you all exactly the same things again. Um, but thinking about um, the MBK as a collaborative catalogue as the whole thing. So what we didn't talk about um, particularly was how it can uh, give a view of the UK's national collection. Um, and that's particularly important um, for the serials work that um, We've been doing with the British Library for UKOR, so I'll talk about that um, in a minute. Um, the compare service, um, again, for the, the scarcity checking for UKOR, and Library Hub cataloging service. Now, we're not um, we're not like ZBB. This is not a centralised cataloging service where everyone catalogues onto the same database. People catalogue into their own uh, local library catalogue and then upload those records to us. So it's, it's very different from that perspective. But hopefully what it can do is um, allow for those moments, as Tasha said in her introduction, when you have been putting off cataloguing that particular serial and you come along and you can search um, Library Hub cataloguing and find that someone has done it for you. Um, and for those brave people, those pioneers who do that original cataloguing, uh, we salute you, thank you. So where do the records come from? As I've said, they come mainly at the, well, at the moment they come entirely from, from library catalogues, plus a few open access sources. I mentioned the Hattie Trust earlier. We also have records on Discover from the Directory of Open Access Books and the Directory of Open Access Journals. Um, what we don't have uh, yet is the, uh, the CONSA data or the ISSN data or the BNB data or the Library of Congress data. We are in the process of getting all of the legalities sorted in order to be able to add those to the cataloging database so that um, Library Hub cataloging users can have access uh, to that high quality material, to those high quality records. Um, it's, it has been held up um, by um, um, by 
legal and contract issues and then um, and then the pandemic hit and um, everything sort of stopped unfortunately but we are doing our best uh, to get that um, information for you as soon as possible so you can access it through cataloging. So the main work that we've been doing at the moment with around serials is with the British Library um, who are running the uh, now running the UKRR that's the UK Research Reserve Programme which aims to ensure that there are um, there's adequate um, conservation and preservation of printed copies of, um, of serials in the UK. Um, so they used to back in the in the Suncat days. It was Suncat who originally started working with um, with the UKRR on this, and they provided um, an excellent service, which we have been trying to live up to. Um, so they used to do the checking. Um, they used to do the checking, but now the British Library are doing it themselves. Uh, the scarcity checking using the Compare service, which is available to them. Um, so we've worked with them to create a specific. Um, export format which is tailored to their needs um, for, for this important work. Again this has all been on hold, um, British Library staff have not been able to physically access their collections um, for a while, um, everything had to be shut down. 2020 has not been, not been the best year for working collaboratively with print material um, but hopefully it has um, uh, sharpened some focus on um, on access to, to online material and there are other parts of DISC which are heavily involved in ensuring um, perpetual access um, to online, online serials. So th the most important point I wanted to make here is that we need a comprehensive and accurate database. That's one of the reasons why we're so keen to have records from as many libraries as possible to ensure that decisions that are being made around the, uh, the preservation um, and retention of, of journals in the UK are being made on a sound, um, on a sound factual basis. Um, and that's, that's it for me now really, because you've already heard from me so much this afternoon. So I will close myself down and hand back over to Tasha. Thank you very much, Bethan. Much appreciated. And finally, um, let's have a little introduction from Anastasia. Hello everyone, I'm Anastasia Kiarameos. <laughs> I, <work, laughs> I work at the British Film Institute in the library. I've been there for about 30 years now. I'm quite new to serials and um, as you'll see by my little introductory uh, PowerPoint stroke video, which I will happily let Jenny show, if that's okay, Jenny. Um, yeah, I usually have more questions than answers, so what am I doing here? Thanks, Jenny. Thank you for having me on the panel. I usually have more questions than answers when it comes to serials, but I'm always happy to share my experience and perspective. Those who had the misfortune of hearing me speak at the SIG conference in 2018 will, I'm sure, remember that it has been my mission to, amongst other things, standardise cataloguing practice across the BFI Rubin Library serials collection. Speak to anyone and they'll tell you standardisation is key, but that's not why I did it. My primary goal was for us to set a standard best suited to our users' needs and also our own. We catalogue and index our serials from scratch. We do not currently, nor have we ever used MARC. We can see the benefits of adopting RDA and are looking forward to the next stages of its development, especially in relation to serials, sorry, I mean diachronic works, but we're not there yet. For as long as I can remember, our records have been organised in a hierarchy, serial title level, serial issue level, article level, and item level. Through analytical cataloging, our serials records link out to related data in other parts of the BFI's database to create a whole, a seamless moving image knowledge universe, if you like. My ambition was to bring our cataloging practice up to date 
linking our data to the outside world, and in theory at least, realising its full potential. We are keen to freely share and receive, and yet we have fallen at the first hurdle, metadata retrieval. For a number of years, we were lucky enough to share our journal data with Suncat, and I had hoped to take advantage of its comparison tool and download service, but unfortunately it wasn't to be. We've indicated our interest in sharing our data with the MBK, however there is still work to be done before that can become a reality. Once we're past the first hurdle, that is, we're able to extract the basic metadata required, I hope we will be able to skip, hop and jump past the rest. I'm nothing if not determined, and I will certainly get us to where we need to be, even if it takes us a while longer. And now that's the optimist in me talking. It hasn't been easy getting to where we are, and before I end, I would like to thank everyone who's been kind enough to share their experience and knowledge, either in person or online for free, so that librarians like myself can self-train in the art of serials cataloguing and hopefully make a positive change. Thank you. I hope you could all see that. <laughs> yes, I thought that was okay. that was great. <laughs> well, it's my first share online, so there you go. <laughs> okay, so thank you to these are our panelists. I hope that um, everybody thinks that they're a good panel to have a discussion on serials cataloging. So if the panelists could unmute themselves and bring up the, their videos, that would be smashing. Because I'm going to start off with a relatively simple question um oh and by the way everybody else please feel free to send questions um so first question what is a serial everything is a serial <laughs> and that's it okay I, <laughs> okay i i try an equally absurd um, answer my typical i have two typical reactions when being asked what a serial is or indeed you know about definitions uh, my first reaction is that I get up and leave the room. Uh, now, that would lead to misunderstandings here. I appreciate that. So I give you my second version. And I give you, uh, now, please note, I give you a precise definition of, of what a serial is. A serial is a bibliographic entity that someone <clears throat> who has at least a wee bit of professional credibility has referred to as serial. And of my definition. And I give you, I, I want to, I'll tell you the moment when I decided to, to, to be happy with this definition. In our National Union catalog, the ZEB, we have also newspapers, stuff that is marked as newspapers. And we have early stuff, like, <clears throat> and like most people in, in, in my home country, I was, I was uh, raised to believe that newspapers started sometime in the 17th century, sort of mid 17th century. Okay, so we, we started this national digitization campaign where one of our librarian partner, very scholarly folks, you know, who, who look into newspapers, they said, okay, we'll take care of all the newspapers up to um, 1700. And when they started that project, I actually went into the catalog and I, you know, did a little query and I found, okay, five, 50 titles they had. Um, we had, and I thought, okay, that's a fair bit of work. Good luck. A couple of years later, when they were finished with their work, <clears throat> I did another query, the same query. And I did not find 50 records, 50 newspapers in the ZTB. I found close to 800. Mm. The only difference was <clears throat> the first definition was put into practice by cataloging librarians and they would follow our our um, um, our rules and <clears throat> the remaining 750 newspapers were <clears throat> declared to be newspapers by scholarly folks you know who who are doing this research work and you know a lot of stuff that we for example we would call uh, broadsheets or leaflets you know that would just no it's a newspaper it's a newspaper because it contains a news item so I guess, you know, it depends very much who you ask. Um, um, I've had to learn that, you know, 50, 800, it's, it covers the same, the same data pool. And depending on who you ask, you come up with different um, figures. And of these circumstances, I don't think it's worth our while to 
really brood over the definition of a serial for very long. I that. think I think for me the issue is that um, having become the serials librarian, uh, we were suddenly faced with, oh, okay, well, we we've had a restructuring, we're dividing duties. What's a serial and what isn't? I what are you going to look after, <laughs> and what are you not? And so, obviously, we have journals. Um, we have what we call annuals. Yes, we have. Um, hello. Um, uh, but we also have festival catalogues. So these are kind of not really officially, I guess. I mean, they have no ISSN. You, would you include them? And when you look at other people's catalogues, sometimes they're catalogued as books, sometimes they're catalogued as serials. And to somebody like me, who is new to serials cataloging, I, I, where do I look for the data? So if I want to find that one record that I can... <clears throat> Um, uh, use for, uh, what was the word you used, Tasha? <laughs> Not copy, <laughs> but inspiration, shall we say, in my cataloging. You know, copy is fine. Copy, copy, is copy is good? Copy <laughs> okay. So, yeah, it's, it's quite difficult from, from that point of view. Um, so there is just, no standard, just, uh, I think. To, to add uh, yeah. one little detail, because you were referring to the ISSN. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there would be a f formal criterion, but you can find so many examples. For example, we have integrated into our database the records of a, they call themselves youth archive, youth cultures. And suddenly we have all these punk, punk fanzines and, you know, that type mm -hmm. of material. Of course, these things don't have an ISSN as all the great literature. Uh, are they interesting? Yes, very much so, very much so. So I, I don't see a formal criterion that we can, that we can use in practical terms. Um, looking at the definition as it's presented in RDA, I think one of the things that catalogers struggle with is as Anastasia said is those things that aren't very clearly journals, periodicals. Um, but, and at one of the criteria that catalogers struggle with is that concept of whether or not it, uh, a resource has a predetermined conclusion. Um, and in order to determine whether something has a predetermined conclusion, oftentimes you have to uh, guess from editorials, prefaces, you know, what is the publisher's intention? And I remember when I used to work at the US ISSN Center, and we were the ones who made that determination. Do we assign an ISSN to this? Does this qualify as a serial? And at times, you had to get inside the mind of the publisher to say, is this something that is going to keep being published? Or is does this have a finite conclusion? Um, sometimes from the nature of the material that's being covered, you can tell that it has a finite conclusion. But I think that's one of the areas where people struggle. Uh, whether to catalog as a monograph or serial is a different question from whether it fits the definition of a serial. But whether it fits the definition of a serial oftentimes also is just not clear and it depends on the publisher's intention. We've got a comment from Gordon Dunsire, um, which, who, who says, what distinguishes a serial from any other kind of work is that its content is intended to change over time, primarily through accumulation or replacement of content. As a result, a metadata description of a serial is incomplete until the serial terminates. I would tend to agree with that. I, 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 I'm, yes, it's a, a serial catalogue record just goes on and on and on until it stops. That we actually really bad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we had um, a, a serial, a journal, which was being published as a journal. The publisher called it a journal, but he very much had um, a 10 issue limit in mind. So he was only going to ever publish 10 issues. So that's not a journal. Well, when, when he first uh, proposed this to me, I said, could you please make sure it has an ISSN? If you want to call it a journal, it should have an ISSN, which he did. But he also gave the, each issue an ISBN 
because it's easier to sell through the bookshops. So, you know, we then had the question of, can we include this um, in the indexing? Because, you know, we index serials and this, is it a serial? So this, this is the kind of thing that we daily have to um, consider. And that's why I think collaborations um, and national catalogs are really useful for, for people like, like me who are in a team of two in a small library. <laughs> I must admit, on Suncat, we didn't bother ourselves too much about what was a serial. If you called it a serial and you sent it to us, it was a serial. <laughs> That'll do, because otherwise you could start getting so bogged down, unless it was really, really obviously a monograph and it was coded as a monograph. So, um, to me, the 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 key um, the key thing that we need for when for quest determining a question like that, what is it? What is a serial? Um, we need to have, and I'm just imagining a network of librarians, right? And I'm sitting somewhere on the periphery. Um, I want to ring up somebody and get some expert mm -hmm. advice on this question. You know, I might not be an expert. Um, <clears throat> so to me, if we in a national environment want to decide whether a thing is a serial or not, it's very comes in very very handy if you have one group of people who are recognized to be of some authority. Uh, like for example, in our case, it's the ZTB editorial stuff that will you know in the end say it's a serial, it's not a serial, and everyone is happy with that because you know it doesn't really matter if you call it a serial or not. The main thing is you have to decide. So if you if you have a group of people who are accepted by all the other players to, to be of some authority. That is very, very yeah. helpful indeed. And uh, Levis, you, it, it just makes a lot of definition discussions superfluous. Okay, well, moving on, we've had another question from Jenny Louis. Um, she said, hello, this is informative. Glad to hear it. Um, I have a quiz question, serials versus, versus continuing resources. What are the main differences in cataloging them? Silence. Well, I, I mean, I think that the only, with, with serials in terms of the, from the cataloging perspective, you generally have a succession of issues which all have their cataloging sources that you use to create the basis for a description. You know, whereas continuing resources are part of the, I mean, uh, I'm not talking about the current definitions in RDA of diachronic works. I've been doing this for a long time. So I tend to sort of go back to the definitions that I grew up with, shall we say. Um, but continuing resources is sort of that umbrella category that for both um, serials and for um, integrating what at the time we called integrating resources. So I think part of it is, do you have a succession of issues that, um, that you can then compare as the issues are being published versus um, a single thing which is um, updated or deleted, but you really don't have a set of, um, of issues to be able to compare across issues. I'm sorry, it's very early here on the west coast of the US, so I'm sort of babbling a little bit. It's all right, that's allowed. It's a panel discussion. This is what it's all about, isn't it? <laughs> Um, so, I just I just want to add to that that this is exactly the kind of question that I'm trying to work out at the moment as because we are we have been traditionally pretty much a paper based library. Uh, we now have e-journals as well, and I am trying to start cataloging um, other types of resources, electronic ones. So it's the kind of question I'm trying to get my head around. And when I said in my in my little um, video that I've tried to create a standard across our serials collections basically what I'm trying to do is trying to say okay what's the minimum we require across all of the collections the different types and then what are the differences between them so that because I've had to train kind of myself and my team I want the next person who comes along not to have to um, 
to know where we're coming from, basically. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, in the in the area of electronic serials, one of the, I mean, the the two things we look at are we look to see even though the, the problem with many electronic serials is that the entire issue is not replicated so that you don't have the whole range of bibliographic sources that you would with print issues. In some respects, it's as if the publisher took like when they're digitizing an old run of a print serial. It is as if the publisher took this shelf of issues, they ripped all of the articles out and they put them in one place on the website and organized them. And then they took one copy of like, they took the current issue and ripped the cover and the masthead of that current issue and they put it in another spot in the website. Well, serials catalogers have always looked at every single issue to see what the, the cover, for example, or the title page of every single issue to see how the serial has changed title or changed publication over time. In the electronic environment, unless we actually have full scans of serials, we lose a lot of that information, which is one of the reasons that it is so difficult to try to create, oftentimes to create a description that is a, that is a description of a serial when not all the bibliographic sources have been reproduced in, online. Um, but in any case, the, what we've done within concerts to, to sort of establish practice to say, look at even though you have an incomplete reproduction of a serial online, in those cases, you can still consider it a serial. You know, the, some of the difference between a serial and integrating resource um, is, is there content taken off the website? Is there content that is revised versus just being added to. If it's strictly successive and being added to, then we would then, in a questionable case, uh, our catalogers uh, in the North American community would probably more likely consider it a serial. Um, but if content, or if the content that's added to is not really identifiable as separate little chunks, it doesn't have anything that even closely resembles an issue per se, you know, then we would, uh, not necessarily consider it a serial and we might count it as a website. But um, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the areas for concern for us when we first started counting electronic serials back 15 years ago, uh, you know, 20 years ago was the catalog, was a separate set of cataloging standards being used to create records for, a, let me put it this way. A cataloger would look at an electronic serial that doesn't, have, that doesn't have good complete issues on it and they would say, oh, well, that's a website and I'm going to catalog this as a website. So if you do that, then you would have a print serial that's cataloged um, according to one set of rules, those that apply to serials cataloging. And then you would have the online version of that same resource which we get which would be cataloged as a website so we wanted to try to within the concert program we wanted to try to avoid that as much as possible um, and say okay if if it even remotely resembles a serial and has serial characteristics in the online environment we would we would consider it a serial um, so that's sort of where we've ended up with that but I, but it is strictly a judgment call okay um yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd agree with you on that, Steve. Um, another question, which is which is related, from Emma Booth. Um, hi, does the panel think that, li that libraries' increasing use of and reliance upon centralised indexes and third-party knowledge bases for e-journal metadata has had a positive or negative impact upon the serials cataloguing landscape? I can't say much on that because we we catalog from scratch everything. My current library does as well. <laughs> I can I can say something because we are actually running um, we're running a knowledge base pro um, a project in in the country and it's it's um, it's from the Open Library 
or associated with the Open Library Foundation. I don't know if uh, this is familiar, the Glo Global Open Knowledge Space, GoKB. Um, we found for, for the, the business of licensing and organizing access to electronic uh, journals that we, <clears throat> we, need the, um, we need data from publishers, <clears throat> from the publishers, but we found that the publisher's data wasn't subtle enough, you know, not quite. Um, and we, even in cases where we get an ISSN, we find that an ISSN, they're so beautiful, there's just too many of them. <clears throat> and sometimes we have two or three in one catalog record, you know, by <clears throat> created by odd circumstances. So that, that isn't strong enough as a, as a um, not always strong enough as a, as a criterion. So we first, we, when, we, when we're talking about organizing the business of licensing, electronic um, uh, resources, electronic journals, we need to be, we need to have a clear understanding of what, of what we're actually uh, uh, referring to as a title record, you know, from year to year and, and so forth, you know, all the problems. So we are actually involved in setting up a knowledge base to that, to that, um, uh, for that purpose. And that means we integrate lists of bibliographic records, title records, and we reference them against the ZTB. And our aim is to fetch the identifier. So we, we have a clear understanding, a better understanding of, of what the, the resource is. So I guess my answer to that, to that, uh, to the question regarding um, third knowledge, third party knowledge bases is that we have some hope that it might work out. Um, having said that, it's an, kind of an open bet, you know, that's, it's a very vol volatile, um, environment to say the least I, th I think i think it very much depends on who the knowledge base is being provided by and what their um motivation is in in providing it um we certainly hear from um our libraries that the standard of the metadata they receive for ebooks and free journals is not always high um, particularly when it comes through through aggregators and third parties, and there may there may be many reasons um, for that. But, um, sometimes there's, there can be depreciation in the system, um, but there is um, a, a, an initiative such as such as Hans is referring to is um, you know, it, it would be the ideal. You know, we we would all love to have a central. I would absolutely go crazy for a, a centralised um, authoritative. Um, a knowledge base. Um, one, one of the potential problems that we have found in not only serials cataloging but in, um, in, in all areas of cataloging is that we are again hearing from libraries that as more metadata becomes available through, um, through aggregators, especially when it is part of a, a, a package, um, it devalues um, the work of the in-house catalogers because management can, not always, can see it as we can get this for free. Why would we pay for this to be created in-house? And they don't always appreciate the expertise that catalogers um, bring and especially how complex serials cataloging can be. Um, and one of the questions might be, well, we have these knowledge bases that are all indexed at article level. Why do we need to catalogue um, the serials as they come in as well? So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for the, um, for the community, but it can lead to, if used, if used unwisely and relied on excessively, it can have some negative effects, I think. I think what we can do as libraries with, with respect to knowledge bases is we can sort of form a counterpart to the commercial uh, knowledge bases mm -hmm. where mostly it's all very frequently it's fairly obscure what what is in there and you know what what uh, type of information and data and we can sort of be on the other side and add some precision some librarian precision to our <clears throat> to the local <clears throat> to the to the knowledge bases that we require for our old job. Mm -hmm. um, referring back to what Bethan was saying, um, this reminds me very much of 
going back into the dim and distant past when I used to do retrospective conversion at the Bodleian and I worked on two big uh, retrocom projects. One was a relatively quick and dirty one. So the records that went in were minuscule, but good enough. They were just there to, you could find something if you knew what the car catalog record was. And the other was a full level catalog record and you made it look gorgeous. And obviously there, there is still a lot of discussion about um, the good enough aspect, certainly when it comes to serials cataloging, because it's just seen as so time consuming. Um, but it isn't because it's worth it in the long run. So I think it's a false economy to say, we'll just put a title, we'll just put a brief title on, on and that'll do, people can find stuff they won't find the right stuff. It's, or do you not, yeah. you're looking a bit puzzled, Hans. <laughs> no, I'm not puzzled. I'm just, I'm, or, I'm, I'm sort right. of following you because to an extent we all, we all um, live in the same environment where our bosses think it's too expensive, you know, cataloging and, and um, stuff and so forth. What I was trying to make, <clears throat> um, um, clear through my little presentation is all these infrastructures, <clears throat> all these services that we can actually perform. And there's only one, one reason why we can perform them because we have invested in editorial staff so that no matter, matter whether you're in the north of the country or in the south, if you see a certain ID number, you can resolve that. And it's, you know, you know, for sure, you can bet almost bet your life on it that this is, you know, the entity for such a duration, and you know, then after that, the title split comes, or you know, whatever. Um, if now, if you in an area, in a region, if all can agree on identifiers, it's quite remarkable what kind of services you can put onto that. I mean, who who would have thought, uh, prima facie, that the serious cataloging will lead to having a catalog that is suitable for preservation uh, uh, control. That's not really closely related, but because we have invested editorial work, we can, we can serve as that infrastructure. So yeah, it's a false friend to, to, uh, to be stingy now. Yeah, I quite agree. I agree. <laughs> um, okay, another question. Um, <laughs> if you think this is rubbish, please don't use it. If you also, if you choose to use it, feel free to paraphrase it to make it make sense. How does the panel see the transition to new RDA working with the differences in how serials will be treated when they become diachronic entities? Sorry, my head just went at that point. <laughs> Well, I can maybe, maybe because I'm, I'm representing an outsider's perspective here, um, you know, coming not from the, from the UK. When, when we introduced it, uh, <clears throat> it was a bit disappointing in a, in a way, um, because we sort of, we did not like the, the, the migration to Mark that came with RDA. RDA. We had our own <clears throat> machine readable data format which in our, you know, I just have to live up to the reputation of where I come from. In our views, it was better uh, uh, <clears throat> for it. I'm sorry to have to say that. And, you know, can, can you share it, please? Because <laughs> um, yeah, we don't, all, we don't use Mark. Um, <laughs> it, and it's all in so, German. Yeah. Wouldn't be any good to you. No translators. It, well, you know, I can, I, I could give you a German version, but still, you know, we have given that up. Um, and for the sake of interoperability, we have changed now to RDA, RDA and to, to Mark. Um, I had to console a great many serial catalogers in that process because there was a lot of grief in, in our quarters um, and we feared that <clears throat> so many issues, first, latest, late as B1, you know, you know what I mean. Um, <clears throat> that was major issues for us, but you know, we have swallowed all that and we, um, we, we migrated uh, towards the international formats. And uh, what I can say is we, 
few squeaks and stuff, but we could, we could represent our data in RDA. And we think that within the next couple of years, we will even have, will have reached the point where we can share our data with um, <clears throat> non-German entities. Because of course, we do still do have a tiny part of the data that is German specific, but we will intend to get rid of that. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to second, I mean, within our environment, I'd like to support what Hans is saying. Um, we have a small group that is looking, that is going through the RDA toolkit uh, with a fine tooth comb and identifying, because there are so many options, you can pretty much do anything you want to. So we're basically just identifying all the options that line up more or less with current concert practice. And under the guise of having a metadata community of practice, concert will establish their guidelines, basically identifying all the options that line up with our current practice. So um, I don't think in many respects, as long as we're still in a MARC environment, and encoding records in MARC, there really won't be any significant changes. There'll be a lot of changes of vocabulary and all that, but in terms of the actual practice of the process and the end result, we're not anticipating significant changes. That must be a massive relief to ca uh, catalogers all over the world. <laughs> um, so I did have another question sort of, um, so how does RDA manage to cope with the continuing nature of uh, serials in the flat format, format of Mark 21? Can the two exist? Or would it be better to do serials in a non-Mark format? Again, oh. I can't answer this because we, we don't, we don't yeah. use Mark. Um, in terms of RDA, I, I was very excited when it came along because I, I do think the sort of linked data way is all I see when I see serials are um, connections, you know, and that's what it's all about to me. So uh, restricting it just doesn't seem right. Um, but Diachronic Works, um, you know, Ferber, I, I, I got the sort of work expression, but they're actually being you know, joined. I'm not so sure about that just yet. I digress. Sorry. Um, I, from our perspective, I mean, they, they are just going to have to um, coexist for a while. Um, libraries are um, not in any rush to move away from Mark. Uh, many of them have moved uh, to RDA. Um, but from the perspective for us of um, providing a union catalogue, even if every library in the UK moved to describing their, their diachronic resources um, in RDA by the end of this year, we still have several hundred years of, of back records to deal with um, that cannot be, uh, I was going to say can't be easily altered, that, that really just can't uh, be effectively altered at all. So for us, we have to find um, a way to have to peacefully coexist, at least for the foreseeable future. I think that's a nice way of rounding off that question. <laughs> Post peaceful coexistence. Everybody should be aspiring to that. So I'm going to throw another thing, slightly maybe controversial, maybe not. It depends how seriously you take these things um, question. How important to table of content services and article level information compared with title level description for serials? What do our users search for? Do they want uh, title level descriptions? And what is the current purpose of title level description apart from we've always done it that way? If, if I can come in on that, I'd say yes. <laughs> They're both needed. Uh, we have users who will specifically come in looking for one particular journal. Um, they're not necessarily wanting to look at the articles. We do index still, again, original indexing, um, some of the journals that we take. Um, I would love to be able to just, you know, download the data for articles and not their subjects because we have our own um, subject headings, but 
you know, anything that cuts back on my work. But yes, our users do look for both. Um, our, our users look for both as well, which is sometimes slightly unfortunate because they won't find uh, many article level records um, in, in the MBK and Library Hub. There is another DISC service for that, for, uh, which, which many of you will, I'm sure, have used um, called ZTOC. And we have been talking about um, internally about um, potentials for, for integration or cross searching or excuse me a moment. Sweetheart, I'm just in the middle of talking. Can you wait a moment? Did you know you're yeah. sorry? Um, <laughs> my Phil's very pretty, thank you, darling. Um, <laughs> but there is um I mean there's a problem of um, scale. Yeah, I can't see you at the moment, darling. <laughs> We have, uh, yeah, we, we don't just deal with serials. We have millions upon millions of records in the NBK. If you start adding in uh, uh, article level description into that, and you you, you multiply by, that by a factor of, of of hundreds, and suddenly it becomes information overload. People, um, no matter how good our, our search and filter functions are, it then becomes um, possibly even harder for people to find um, what they want. Um, it's title level can, it, it's another way into it for people. And again, looking at the historic data, we, we have that at title level and to suddenly, to suddenly change and not catalog at title level anymore, um, I, it would be um, very difficult for users to, uh, to deal with, I think. On some catch, we used to link through to CTOC and journal talks from the titles where the metadata was good enough, basically. So, um, would you do you do that on the MBK as well? Uh, we don't at the moment. Um, we have been. Um, there was originally when the MBK was originally being developed, um, there was a plan to. Um, to integrate CTOC data actually into the database, which is why we didn't put the, the links in. Um, that hasn't happened yet. We don't know if that actually will happen, but at some point there, we will be putting in um, some kind of linkage with CTOC and potentially with Core as well. So looking at the open access versions of, of these articles. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of other things to develop, but it is on the list. And that's a nice way of linking through to the article level without it basically just swamping all your day, all your your entire catalogue. It is. It is. It was. It was a nice feature on Suncat, and it's a shame that we haven't been able to um, <laughs> to have something similar yet on the MBK. Yeah. And from and abroad, yeah. I can I can sort of. Um, um, we have the same the same type of situation. Uh, ZTB only offers title level records, and it's a it's a used service. You know, users come and use our our catalog. So you know, we have a clear indication that that makes sense. Uh, we also not with ZTB but other places in Germany have huge databases where they offer article services, and uh, these services are hugely uh, um, heavily used as well. So I guess my conclusion is too both. Um, descriptions on both levels are requirement required and I, since I'm responsible for national union catalog with the old item I think dates back to 1544 so you know it's a mixed bag um, I sympathize with what Beth was saying that <clears throat> you know we might um, uh, make our catalogs a bit difficult to use if we overburden them with too many informations so it's very much a question of where you where would you locate such a, an article. Well, I would like to provide a contrarian point here, only in the sense that um, I I am in an environment in a typical uh, academic library where we have purchased a commercial discovery system, which is providing, you know hundreds of millions of article citations within the same search environment as the bibliographic records. I agree that both title and article level, level metadata are important, but I think in terms of priorities, um, even, though, even though users look for journal titles, when I go through search logs, 
I don't see a lot of evidence of things that are jump out to me as journal titles. Okay. So I'm basing this statement upon that assumption. As long as, long as the metadata that is provided for electronic journals includes standard identifiers that support linking, uh, primarily the ISSN title, uh, possibly corporate bodies or something else, um, that is sufficient for, in my opinion, 95 to 99% of our needs for journal, for article access. Now, when the user comes in looking for an article or looking for articles. So in terms of priorities, I am going to place a higher priority on the print collection, which is not accessible at all, period, because we have no records, versus the electronic collection, which we are able to provide access to our users. I agree that the enhancement of those title level records is important, but in looking at priorities, something is better than nothing, in my opinion. Um, now, having said that, I coordinate a project every year to make sure that we have full level cataloging, full mark records with complete authority work, subject control, all of that for all of the titles in DOAJ. You know, so uh, because we have a commitment to open access and because those articles are not necessarily always going to be indexed. That article metadata is not always going to be there in discovery systems. So I agree to the importance of full level data for all serials. I think that for the online journal literature, having full level records may not be as critical. Again, it depends on your environment. Within our environment, um, I don't think having those full level e-journal records is necessarily as critical. But it's been incredibly useful for us now because all of our staff are work from home. So I've just been giving them, I've just been identifying collections, Science Direct, Hein Online, you know, just say, okay, everyone go for it. You know, just catalog to your heart's content because this is the environment, this is what we have for now. You know, but I think that's just how it works for us in our environment. I think for us, it's nice to have, um, I mean, as I showed in my slide, we have one database for, for the BFI and it really should serve the needs of our, of our users, um, our audience. So we want to know um, which film festival an actor has been a participant in, if they won an award, uh, we want to know when that festival took place, if we have any newspaper cuttings for it, if we have a festival catalogue for it, if there was an article written about the festival or about the film, and it's all within one database. And so for us, it's actually, I think, really important that our journals, um, our serials are at article level and actually have that rich metadata that links out. To, to everything else. Um, I don't want to necessarily do it all myself. <laughs> I would be happy if I could get the correct data from elsewhere and then enrich it. Uh, but at the moment, that's not happening. Ethan, were you going to say something? Um, I, I was, and now I, I know I possibly have two things to say. Um, so let's treat the second one first, because that's from, um, I think it would be, um, it's, it's an interesting thought, Anastasia, to have a, um, a collaborative cataloging service for TOCs, um, as well as you know, what's available for purchase from, from people like the British Library, if there was a place where um, you didn't have to do this all yourself, where people could, um, you know, one, someone could catalogue the TOC and then other people could could easily find it um, and download it without, I think at the moment you'd probably have to go to the library's individual catalogues and or to the, the journal's website. So it would, it would be, you just started the seed of an idea there, sorry. Um, my other point was um, listening to both both you and Stephen, um, it, it really does depend on our audience. 
uh, you know whether they do want but for your users of the bfi it's very clear that that what you that the um rich article level best data is very important and thinking about um the search for title level in a way i think i'm i'm dating myself here by saying this is what we were trained to do you know we were taught that when you search for a journal you don't search for the article you search for the journal and then even even in online databases not just the library catalog and that has you see i am i am dating myself quite significantly here um <laughs> this has changed to a certain extent with um uh, with um I've, I've completely forgotten the name for them those okay. those big things that have all the dates in them. <laughs> excuse me um because um the, the the students who are using those now are probably much more likely to be searching for article level data but there are significant numbers of users who are who are sort of more from from my era who would be putting in journal titles first and then drumming down so it really is extremely um audience dependent I think it's I think it's researchers who, you know, are not new to researching. They know which titles are important to their research, so they will go straight to them. Um, and then you have the, shall we say, younger students who will look at articles. They will try and find things through subject headings. Now, for us, an aggregator like that doesn't really help. I mean, uh, people end up using sort of free text and getting lost. Whereas with our database, because we used to index the journals, uh, and we still do some of them uh, ourselves, we have very specific subject headings that we use. Um, so there's benefits to both. But um, I had another point, and now I've forgotten it. <laughs> but <laughs> I think I've made it anyway. I'll, I'll come yeah. back. I just have to say your, your database sounds wonderful. It is wonderful. It sounds, you know, perfectly, um, you know, hand, hand curated, um, designed <laughs> exactly for the needs of your users. I wish we could all um, produce something so, yeah. so perfectly tailored. Um, yeah, what I was what I was thinking was also that this this business of whether you come in at title level or at article level. Um, you see, to me, having started in serials quite late, I mean, literally only about seven years ago there's no sort of one top layer you come in from wherever you want to end up at um, somewhere else so you could come in at an article and end up at the title so oh look this journal has all the stuff I really want I'll look at this one from now on uh, or you could start with oh look I found this journal oh yeah it's got really <laughs> really good stuff and my other point is that what I would like to be able to do for people is to say, okay, here's the record for the print journal, which we do have in our collection, and you can come and look at it. But if you can't come in and look at it, be aware it's also published here online. Also be aware that it's been digitized and it's part of, I don't know, archive.org or Europeana, or whoever. So I kind of want our catalog to be uh, a research portal, really if that makes sense. I almost see the way that you're describing it, Anastasia, as the you've got your old fashioned linear approach of going to the card catalogue where you know almost know what you you're searching for, whereas you're looking at it much more as a big thing and you can just go in it. It's it's like web searching. You just manage to drill down and find something. Yeah, it doesn't matter which way you come in, you always end up at the richness. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, another question. This is from Martin. He did send this a little while ago. Sorry about that. Where is the line between series and serials? Should there be one? In, R in RDA, surely the definition will blur further. I don't deal with series. <laughs> So we're back to our definition of what is a serial. Yeah. <laughs> the subtlety of the question is sort of lost on me. Okay. Um, I think, again, it, to my mind, the differences should be between um, whether a serial should is an ongoing publication. You, you don't know quite when it's going to finish. A series normally has a 
should have a fixed end date. Of course, there are exceptions to all the rules. Um, but I, I just love it how, how we describe um, uh, regular circumstances. Yeah. Usually, probably, Stephen was saying it will be most likely that we do that and you know classify it as a serial. It's quite interesting that we use uh, the terminology of vagueness to uh, talk about rules here. I actually have a theory about this. Um, many, many, many years ago, I did a classics degree, so did spent a lot of time doing Latin and Greek. And to me, monographic cataloging is like Latin. It's very regular. It's quite straightforward. Serial cataloging is like Greek, where everything is an exception to the rule. <laughs> I apologize. It's a wonderful <laughs> My heritage. <laughs> Sorry. Right, you know, it was the ancient Greek. <laughs> different people. You know, that's really funny because the way that I characterize that difference, and I offended some monograph catalogers, so I don't use it very often, is that monograph cataloging is like doing an autopsy, and serials cataloging is uh, like studying a, uh, an organism that is, you know, changing and developing, and, you know, the difference between, uh, organize, you know, analyzing a dead thing versus a living thing. That makes me think of too many sci-fi films where <laughs> it's gone wrong. <laughs> it's all right. This is a safe space. We can, I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> dismonograph completely, but yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, oh, sorry. We have a serious reply to that. Um, series tend to have issues that are monographs. Uh, serials tend to have issues that are aggregates of articles. This is not the terminology of the new RDA, and that's from Gordon Dunn Sire. So, um, shall we move on to a slightly less contentious subject? <laughs> okay, uh, what shall we choose? The sector wants desiloization, but um, so everybody has the same sort of we want to get out of cataloging as an individual and share our catalog records, but the record but the sector also wants to maintain its individuality and how are we going to achieve that in the UK landscape or in the German and Austrian landscape come to that and American sorry well, in, in the German and Austrian case it's it's um, that that is being the case um, mm -hmm. we have um, the central database and the and the catalog interfaces that are attached to it provide access to the entirety of the data from Germany and Austria. And then of course, in the local catalogs of the libraries, you have institutional library specific views on the, of the materials. So it's, it depends where you go, you know, and you see your local slides in the local OPEC and you see the, the, the full cake in a, in a central database. So we provide both, if I understood the question correctly. Um. I'm seeing that as certainly in the UK, it's been very much a traditional, um, an institution will create its own records and we, they will grudgingly share them with another, with, a, with something like COPAC or Suncat or now the MBK. Um, but now there's just so much information we have the vendor supplied records, you have all the e-journal records, but you can't curate, unless you're Anastasia, of course, <laughs> the most amazing catalogue, which is perfect for their libraries. So, but you still want to maintain your individuality as an institution, um, uh, as a specialist library or as a university library. So, um, basically how do we how do we achieve keep the keep the individuality without um without while while managing to still catalog everything I th <laughs> right well, um i think go ahead Stephen, go ahead yep. um i mean one of the i mean with i think in north america at least among the concert participants we have a general practice of you do what concert, you know, you have your, you have your network level record and then you make local changes to that. 
you know, if you want to make local changes. One of the things, but one of the things that we did that has nothing to do with cereals is there, uh, prior to our migration to Alma in 2013, um, we uh, had cataloging practices for video recording. So we added a ton of local genre headings to video recording records um, and to uh, um, motion picture um, audiovisual material records. When we were when we migrated to Alma and specifically to a network zone record where we were required to use a network level record where it was not easy to make local customizations, we ended up having a project to try to populate um, the national authority file with as many genre terms as you know to work cooperatively with the Nash with Seiko and with um, to try to get as much of our local practice, which followed Seiko guidelines into Seiko so that that information actually could be at the network level uh, in a network level record. Um, so that's another approach that you can take is to sort of take, think about those local uh, edits and that local information and how and is any of it actually uh, valuable to other users? And if so, then put it in the network level record. I think that sounds good. And we have time for one very last quick question. Um, just to capital, standard one for the times, is Mark dead in relation to serials cataloging? I think we've already know what, well, I know what my answer is. But I could sum it up. It's not, it should be, and it will be. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I have to say that um, having not used Mark at all at work, I have had to learn in effect Mark because everybody talks in the terms of Mark. So if you, if you want to be understood, um, you have to, see what other people are doing and compare what you're doing with them so yeah if, if it is dead soon then um, that's fine okay sorry <laughs> I must admit I think it it, it needs imp it needs a lot of improving it needs changing but it has done very very well it's a good workhorse but if we change to something else, I think we'll end up with um, two types of catalog, um, one in mark and one in one not. And until we all our systems are able to cope with something which is non mark, um, we are not in a position to throw it away just yet. Please don't mention the word systems. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Anastasia and I have a long history with Three Sun Cat with this. <laughs> yeah. um, and we have had a comment from Steph Longmuir who says, thanks for a very interesting discussion. Um, she's loved the session, lively but informative. So I hope that rounds everything up. Um, thank you very much to our panel. I thought that was a most enlightening afternoon and thank you for joining us. Thank you um, for having I'm us. not sure if we put the world of cereals cataloging straight, but we've certainly asked a lot of questions and we've had a good discussion. And I hope that you'll see, you have had your cereals cataloging needs satiated for the time being, or at least your appetite has been whetted. And if you could please stay and answer the poll that we've set up for requirements for cereals cataloging, I'm hoping that will come online in two shapes. But in the meantime, thank you to Bethan, Hans, Steve, and Anastasia, you've been awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Plus one. <laughs> okay. That's all right. We've got. Um... Okay. Thanks to all the panelists, and uh, thanks for all the questions. <laughs> yep. Same here. Thanks and bye. Yeah. Um, now the only thing now is, um, yeah, the, the there might be minor another technical problem. Not that there's been any technical problems so far. Oh, well, there you go. There goes the serials poll. So yeah. See so if you want to answer those.